I'm Doug, stand-up physicist. This is the sixth of six shows dedicated to my lectures Unifying Gravity and Electromagnetism by Analogies to Electromagnetism. And this show is really exciting because we are going to try and do two different but important things. First, we're going to try and come up with an experimental test that can either confirm or reject this proposal. And second, we are going to address a huge problem that gravity faces with constant velocity solutions. We begin with relativistic gravitational forces. If you recall what I said about units, that means we should see a G and a C, but not an H. We start with a weak gravitational force. We then find a solution that involves the velocity. And we try and find a exact solution to that that is physically relevant. We look at the Schwarzschild metric of general relativity, which is a solution to the Einstein field equations, and we compare the gem metric with this. And that is how we're going to end up with something that is experimentally testable. So let us begin with a weak gravitational force equation. We start with the more general relativistic force equation. We see that we have a change in momentum, and so we apply the chain rule to that term. And we are going to make an assumption that the mass does not change with respect to spacetime. If mass changed with respect to time, you'd be doing rocket science literally. <laughs> but if mass changes with respect to space, I think we start doing astrophysics. And I think that term is going to help us explain the rotation profile of galaxies as well as maybe deal with problems of the Big Bang. But we're not going to do that starting out. We are going to presume it is zero. So then we have to recall results from the last show where we were looking at a weak gravitational field that had no electric charges in it. And with those assumptions in mind, we were able to get this very simple expression that depended on a spring constant with units of length over the sigma squared. We want to just do a small sanity check and see that the units are in fact correct. We really do have the units of force. We then plug all this stuff into our equation and we do a contraction of the four velocity with that uh, the way the uh, field strength tensor changes, do a little bit more rearranging with tau's and sigmas, and we end up with the relativistic force equation. We're going to come back to that equation three different times in this lecture. Now we want an exact solution to this weak gravitational force equation. It should be possible because it's really just a first order differential equation with respect to the four velocity. And so we apply the chain rule and as before, we're going to assume that mass does not change with respect to the interval. We now uh, collect the terms onto one side and we use the equivalence principle, which states that the inertial mass and the gravitational mass are exactly the same. If that is the case, then we can just cross these m's out. And experiments have actually shown that those two are equal, so this is a good thing. Now we need to solve this differential equation 
and it's a relatively simple one, and we get a velocity that's equal to some constants times uh, a couple of exponentials. We now want to get rid of those constants. So what we do is we contract this velocity. And in flat space-time, that should equal c squared. Because of that equality, we can actually eliminate these constants. We can say these must be doing this kind of role. This must be this velocity. And so it, so it is. And we do a little rearranging and we end up with an expression that has the same form as a metric. It has the form of d tau squared equals dt squared times an exponential factor minus that an exponential factor times dr squared. Now this is a metric but it's not really a metric tensor and that's something that those guys who are really good in math will uh, worry about probably for a while. But it looks physically relevant in the sense that if that k factor of k goes to zero or the tau goes to infinity, this becomes the Minkowski metric of flat spacetime. So it's consistent with flat spacetime. But if that spring constant is not zero, then this will represent curved spacetime. Now let's apply this exact solution. By that I mean let's see what we need to put in here to get something that is physically relevant to describing our universe. So we will presume that that spring constant is the gravitational mass of a system expressed in units of length. So that means it's gm over c squared. We then use the static field approximation where we say, you know, the amount of change in time is really small. This isn't new to this approach because in order to get that simple k over sigma squared uh, uh, for the change in the potential, we had already kind of assumed this. So we're really being consistent with assumptions already made. Interval tau is going to have the same size as the sigma and it's all going to be r because time is not making much contribution at all. And sigma is not tau. They're related to each other by a factor of i and I've arranged this so that the result would be real. So if we put all these assumptions into our exact solution we end up with this metric expression. d tau squared equals e to the minus 2 gm over c squared r dt squared minus e to the plus 2 gm over c squared r uh, times dr squared. And it's really nice and symmetric. One has a plus 2, the other has a minus 2. And so you can see time and space changes are equal partners. Is this physically relevant? Well, let's discuss the Schwarzschild metric of general relativity. The Schwarzschild metric is a solution to the Einstein field equations. And what you do with it is, in practical way, is that you take what's called the Taylor series expansion because the coefficients are really tiny. So with these tiny coefficients, you just keep a few of these terms. And the ones that are underlined are really the only ones that get tested. And so there are five terms there. And they've been tested for bending of light around the sun, for radar reflections off of um, Mercury, and for the precession of the perihelion of uh, Mercury. And it has passed every test of the weak field to first order parameterized post-Newtonian accuracy. That's a very good thing. Let's compare the gem metric with this Schwarzschild metric. If we take the Taylor series of both, we'll notice that those five terms are exactly the same. So that means for all those tests, bending of light, precession of the perihelion, 
um, and radar reflections going to get the same result at first order. But if you go to second order, they're going to be different. As a matter of fact, for light bending around the sun, the GEM theory predicts 0.8 micro arc seconds more bending. We can detect bending around the sun to 100 micro arc seconds. So we're probably going to have to improve the resolution a thousand fold before we can really be sure of the difference. And I talked to one of the world's leading experts on experimental tests of general relativity and he says they're not even talking about doing this experiment. It's too difficult with today's technology. But this is incredibly important that we have a clear and quantifiable difference between general relativity and this GEM proposal. It means that if we were to put the money in time and get enough luck and skill in there, we could decide on experimental grounds alone whether this proposal is right and general relativity is wrong, or general relativity is right and this proposal is wrong. None of the other fields of gravity study, which would be string theory and loop quantum gravity and maybe that non-communicative geometry stuff, can make this simple kind of statement. Do this test and it's either right or it's wrong. But we can do that on this show because we are the most sophisticated theoretical physics program on cable. Now, on aesthetic grounds, you know how something looks. This gem metric looks better. Because if you look at the coefficients, they both start out the same. 1, minus 2, and then with the Schwarzschild metric, they get different. They get different and they stay different till eternity. Whereas with the gem proposal, they start the same and they stay the same up to a plus or minus sign. And it is a safe bet to bet on a theory that is more symmetric. Particularly since we're de describing a, a symmetric uh, mass that isn't moving at all. Time's contribution should be exactly the same as space. And that is the case for GEM, but not for Schwarzschild metric of general relativity. Now we turn from relativistic gravitational forces to classical gravitational forces. We'll still have that constant G in here, but there should be no C and no H. So we have to break space-time symmetry and break it the same way every single time. And so we'll go through that. And then I will actually derive Newton's law of gravity. I then go to describe two huge problems faced by gravity. We need new classical gravitational field solutions. Because right now we cannot explain the rotation profile of a galaxy using Newton's law. We cannot explain how the Big Bang works with Newton's law. We need something that involves gravity, that has a constant velocity solution, and somehow changes the distribution of mass through space. And we will conclude by doing a derivation exactly like the Newtonian one, except that a starting assumption is different. And that will be a constant velocity solution where mass does change with respect to space. How should we break space-time symmetry? Well, special relativity and Minkowski space-time is true and elegant and wonderful. Newtonians completely separate space and time is actually quite accurate and darn practical. The math's a bit easier. There is the interval tau in special relativity 
that tells you the distance between two events. It also allows time to mix with space. Well, in space and time, time and space are separated. There is no interval tau. Instead, you can think of a space difference. Now there is the four velocity. That is the change in time with respect to the interval and the change in space with respect to the interval. Well, in Newtonian space and time, you no longer have an interval. You just have this r, the absolute value of r. And since time and space aren't related to each other, that ends up being zero. And if you take now the derivative of r with respect to the absolute value of r, you get r hat, a directional derivative. It just says, go that way. If you now want to look at the relativistic acceleration, you hit this again with a d tau squared, and no problem uh, with rel special relativity, but on the Newtonian side, what was a zero stays a zero, and you end up with this second der uh, order derivative. Now we will derive Newton's law of gravity. And we start as we started on our road to the gem metric with a four-force equation for a weak field. We then apply the chain rule to the cause side of things and say that mass changing with respect to space-time is exactly zero. Forget about it. <laughs> then we need to break symmetry in the way I just described. We no longer have four velocities and four accelerations. We have those substitutions to make. Go ahead and do that. We then do kind of a lot of rearranging of things, d tau's for dt's and, um, and whatnot, but we end up with exactly Newton's force equation. This is very good because Newton's been wonderful for people who are rocket scientists for people who are studying our own planet. But it has two huge problems. And it's important to know how huge these problems are. Because general relativity, Einstein's theory, actually, uh, actually solved a bunch of small problems. The precession of the perihelion of Mercury is like so small, it's ridiculous. And bending around of light around the sun, well, that was, that was a factor of two. But the rotation profile of galaxies, oh my gosh, it's huge, the error. Because what you, because these galaxies, if you look at the stars way out on the limb, their velocity is flat. And there is a constant velocity solution to Newton's force equation. And what it absolutely requires is how fast the mass drops off. It must go no faster than like a factor of the square root of m uh, with respect to r. Um, but that's not the, how, how it falls off. It falls off exponentially, which is so much faster that the velocity really should not stay constant. It should really drop, but it doesn't. But there's another problem too, and that is if you have a galaxy and you give it a little nudge on its center axis, it should curl up into a little ball, <laughs> which it doesn't really do. Even when two galaxies are like passing through each other, they're not like curling up into a little ball. So we need a solution that's constant velocity, that is stable mathematically, that involves gravity. There's a huge problem with the Big Bang. One problem is known as the horizon problem. And it's the fact that all the stuff in the earliest universe was traveling at the same velocity. And yet, they weren't close enough for them to agree on what that velocity should be. And secondly, the solution for the Big Bang is mathematically unstable. 
So to last this 13 billion years or so, the initial conditions have to be absurdly fine-tuned. So what we need is a solution that is mathematically stable, that is constant velocity, and that involves gravity. And that's exactly what I said we needed for uh, spiral uh, galaxies. So let's find such a solution. So we start exactly where we started before. Not a bit of difference. We are starting with the relativistic four-force equation for a weak gravitational field. We apply the chain rule, but this time, since we want a constant velocity solution, we better demand that the change in the velocity with respect to the interval is zero, but not the change of mass with respect to the interval. We break space-time symmetry as we did before. We assume the same gravitational con uh, spring constant as before, g m over c squared. We collect the terms onto one side, and we solve this differential equation. And we do the usual kind of tau sigma kind of substitution, and we say it's a static kind of thing, so it's going to really depend on the size of r. And then you have this expression which describes with a constant velocity how mass changes in space. Now is this reasonable? Well, there is a theory called MOND for modification of Newtonian dynamics, which numerically does a great job of describing how um, galaxies, spiral galaxies, rotate. And basically it says that when things get, acceleration gets really, really tiny, then what happens is that gravity goes from a 1 over r squared law to a 1 over r law. Well, what we have here is mathematically very similar. Because an exponential like that is a function of 1 over r. And there is a factor of c in here that will basically do most of the effect until you get to something really small. And then it will start to appear. What have we accomplished with these six shows? Well, I gave us 16 criteria. So let's go over them. First, about gravity, there were five criteria. Like charges attract, that's the way our relativistic force was. That there should be one charge, if you put in a minus, makes no difference. That we could get Newton's gravitational field law, we got that. That was, you just look at the field equations and it's there. Could we get to Newton's force law? We did that today. Could we get to a dynamic metric equation that was consistent with tests so far? Yes. And experimentally different? Yes, by 0.8 micro arc seconds uh, for light bending around the sun. Uh, EM is easy because we were doing analogies to EM. EM is all there. Light charges repel, two distinct charges, um, the source equations, and the uh, vector identities. Then as far as quantum mechanics is concerned, it's reasonable to think that this should be quantizable because it's just like the gupta bleuler quantization. However, I haven't done a second order, uh, you know, Taylor's, uh, Feynman kind of calculation thing for scattering cross-section. That's a kind of technical thing that professional physicists will demand. And then, this, will it work with a standard model? I think so, because gravity is always about a dynamic metric, and when you really crunch together the standard model to make a scalar, it's got to be there. And where's mass? It's in the diagonal of the asymmetric tensor. If we finally go out there and get LIGO to work, General Relativity predicts a transverse wave, and if they're right, my hat's to, off to them. But if they're wrong, look to this show. And then Big Bang cosmology and the, sp the uh, spiral galaxies, that might be explainable by this approach in a way that is um, really important if true. 
So thank you very much. All the girls in the classroom who think he's hot, he shows up wearing the sandals with the white socks. He hears him giggling while he's got his back to the class. He thinks he's got an eraser mark on his ass. And all the girls from the hall show up to hear him talk, even though most of the time he's covered in chalk. Math prop rock star. No, I do not understand either.